people maybe go ahead and get started. There may be a couple more people who will wander on in, so I think we'll really get started since we only have um, a little less than an hour. So thank you very much for coming. My name is Annie Bostadina. I direct the NSW program here at the School of Social Work. I'll be introducing our speaker, Dr. Shannon Dorsey, in just a minute. Uh, but before I do that, I want to just step back for a second, just let you know a little bit about the speaker series and let you know about some of the upcoming speakers that we have coming. Um, this is uh, part of a speaker series that's a, a collaboration of, of the Evidence-Based Institute, um, which is part of the, the Division of um, Public Behavioral Health and, um, and Justice Policy and uh, collaboration with the School of Social Work. And we've been putting on these monthly um, speaker presentations this year and as, as last year as well. Um, and we have uh, slides from last year and PowerPoints and videos from last year's presentations um, at the website if you take a look at this link down here. Um, but this is entitled, the series is entitled Referral to Evidence-Based Mental Health, for what, for whom, and how. This part of this ed evidence-based um, uh, uh, effort is trying to bring more evidence-based interventions to people who are working with children and families, to practitioners who are delivering interventions, as well as to those who might be making referrals, and trying to figure out who should be referred and to, to what and for what kind of intervention. Uh, the upcoming uh, presentations that we have, we have Jamila Reed coming uh, January the 6th. This is it's actually the first Thursday from now on. We had a little bit of a different schedule earlier. Um, so the first Thursday uh, in January, Jamila will be talking on preventive and parent-based interventions for oppositional defiant and conduct disorders. Uh, Thursday, February the 3rd, Kevin King will be speaking on motivational approaches for children's mental health. Uh, Michael McDonald, best practice assessment and treatment of serious mental illness in adolescence. That's March the 3rd. And Janine Jones, presenting on evidence-based practice in multicultural contexts. That's May the 5th. And uh, Carrie McCarthy will be our last one, uh, school-based interventions for childhood and adolescent depression. Uh, so more information is on these websites, and when I send out the announcements about, um, about these speakers series, you have the, the website at the bottom there, so you can take a look there at prior presentations, or if you miss one, you can go there and, and see the video, generally uh, a couple of weeks um, after the presentation has happened. Um, so I wanted to just introduce our speaker, Dr. Shannon Dorsey. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and, and Behavioral Sciences here at the UW. Uh, she's a clinical psychologist by training, and her research interests and clinical expertise are in evidence-based treatment for children and adolescents. Uh, she's focused on interventions for youth who are impacted by trauma and focused on how to apply these interventions uh, for youth who are in out-of-home placements like foster care youth um, and therapeutic foster care, as well as thinking about how to launch interventions internationally, thinking about those countries that are resource poor and um, trying to, to bring those interventions there. Uh, Dr. Dorsey is an expert in trauma-focused CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and she conducts trainings nationally and internationally. Uh, she's been to places like Tanzania and Kurdistan, Vietnam. Um, she's also currently working on a number of NIMH-funded as well as state and, and foundation-funded projects, um, trying to improve functioning of youth by improving their access to and receipt of evidence-based interventions for their mental health disorders. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Dorsey. For the presentation. Thank you. I trust with everyone that is braving the end of the academic quarter. <laughs> Thank you for all coming. So, given that I know about half of this audience, <laughs> mm -hmm. I know a little bit about people's exposure to um, evidence based practices and anxiety. So, we can keep this kind of informal. I'm going to show you some things. Um, I'll move us along a little bit because at the end I want to at least show you one of the videos from the Trauma Focus CBT web training because I think it's a great resource to go from here to get more training. Um, so I'll definitely keep us moving for that. But if you have any questions, let me know. I'll save some time at the end because I think this is a group that a lot of you I know already know a lot about evidence-based practice for um, mental health in general and then also for anxiety disorders. So the goals today will be just to, I'm going to mention some common anxiety disorders, talk a little bit about the common elements of treatments for anxiety disorders, what it should look like, and then a little bit about how these elements are applied differently for different types of anxiety disorders. And just given my expertise with trauma and PTSD, I'll focus particularly on that. Also because it's the treatment for trauma and PTSD is more widely available in Washington and we have great online resources, which is a really nice thing. I feel like you can leave here and get more information on, and you can get it for free, and that's great. 
Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit, because of the goal of the, this speaker series, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to evaluate treatment to figure out if it's ev evidence-based. If, for example, you're referring a kid for treatment, or even if someone you know has a child in treatment, just to figure out, is the treatment aligned with the evidence-based model? So I think most of you have seen or heard of or met kids with or talked to parents of kids with these various disorders. And what's nice is that treatment across all of them has a lot of common elements, which is the focus for today. The last two are a little more of a special case, um, trichotillomania, which is the one where people kind of pull hair, and then OCD, slightly different, but still very common elements. So what are the common features of those anxiety disorders that I just put up? Testing your memory and knowledge. What are the common things that you see in terms of behavior or emotions across those anxiety disorders? Yeah, so kids can be withdrawn, right? I just gave you one of the answers. It starts with an A. They all have anxiety, right? Some fear. What's the other A word common to anxiety? Avoidance, right? So if you look at all these disorders, they all have maybe some withdrawal, some anxiety, some avoidance, fear, right? Some behaviors that go along with if you avoid things. You've got behaviors that you may do when you think you can handle the situation, so you may avoid, but you may think I can manage it only if, for a little kid, I take this blanket, or someone with OCD, I can manage only if I can count things a lot of times. So the reason the treatments are really similar is across the anxiety disorders, you've got common thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, and so there are a lot of folks saying, hey, why don't we simplify this and not have 18 different manuals? Why don't we have a common elements approach? And so if people have seen the work of Bruce Torpeda or John Weiss, um, John Barlow is doing this with adults. There's a lot of great articles and materials out there now. But you can learn a couple things and apply it across disorders. My favorite thing about being in the area of anxiety disorders is one, we know how to treat them. Two, it's not that hard. <laughs> And we're good at it. We're successful. Kids get better. Now, sometimes it's hard to, to convince ourselves as clinicians or to convince other clinicians to do the parts that make it work, but the treatment itself is not hard. Sometimes buying into the aspects of exposure, which I'll talk about in a little bit, can be challenging. But we know how to treat these disorders. We know how to treat them well. We have good success rate. And we can't say that for every disorder. And so I think the field of anxiety is actually a really fun field to be in. Um, the other thing is that I think since if you look at different states, different evidence-based practices for evidence-based evidence, I mean, sorry, for anxiety disorders are available. And the nice thing is because they're common, if you know a clinician who knows how to treat PTSD and they're doing evidence-based treatment for PTSD and you don't have another referral option that's specific to, say, social phobia or school anxiety, that kind of person is great to refer to because they know a lot of the elements that walk across the different anxiety disorders. Does that make sense? So the common elements in most of the anxiety disorder treatments are on here. So some psychoeducation explaining what anxiety is, why it impacts us, um, how it becomes to be a problem. I really like the match way they talk about this. They talk about it, um, John Weiss and Bruce Trapita's work. They talk about anxiety as like a fear alarm and for some kids it's just gotten too sensitive. That's such a nice normalizing way to talk about it. Like everybody has a fear alarm, but kids with anxiety disorders, it's just turned up too high, right? It's just notched up too high that everything seems dangerous. It's going off too frequently. Um, and when you avoid things, what happens? If you avoid something you're afraid of, how do you feel? Better, right? Avoidance is really adaptive. The problem is, does avoidance get stronger or weaker the more you do it? Anybody have a needle phobia or an elevator phobia? The more you avoid the things you're scared of, the stronger that fear gets. And so letting people know that up front is one of the most important ways to let them know why in the evidence-based treatments, we do the opposite of that. We face versus avoid. We approach versus avoid. Um, so why avoidance can be helpful in the short term, it's not very helpful in the long term. So psychoeducation is a big part. And the biggest part of all anxiety treatments is some sort of exposure and desensitization where you actually have the client face their fear. So a kid who's scared of school, what do they have to face? School. Kids who have a social phobia, they're scared of being around other kids, 
talking to people, making friends, what do they have to do? Take steps towards, yeah, take steps towards making friends. Same with phobias, and we'll talk about the special case of trauma related to exposure and desensitization, but every treatment for anxiety that has evidence has this component. It is the most common component across all the evidence-based treatments that's connected to evidence, exposure and desensitization. The other ones that are really common are self-monitoring, like recognizing when you're feeling anxious and how much, and then also relapse prevention, so having a plan when you get anxious for what you're gonna do. You also sometimes see coping strategies and some cognitive restructuring. Cogn cognitive restructuring is very important for treatment of PTSD, less important or less integral to other anxiety disorders. Um, so some really specific models that I like to bring up just in case you've seen them. I think the field is largely moving to kind of a common elements approach in general, but there are some great treatments. Coping cat is for all types of fears. It's an individual model. Coping koala is a group model. How many people have heard of trauma-focused CBT in here? Good, okay. So most people know TFCBT. CBITS is a school-based treatment that's very similar, cognitive behavioral intervention for trauma in schools that um, is group-based. And OCD, one of the most common ones, is exposure and response prevention. But all of these, again, and my goal for today is not to go through any of these in great detail, but just to point out that these are the evidence-based models, and they have these common components of psychoeducation, gradual exposure, self-monitoring, relapse prevention, and then some also have the coping and the cognitive restructuring. TFCBT is widely accessible in Washington. I think the degree to which it's implemented with high fidelity, like any program that's widely available, varies, but we have a lot of TFCBT in Washington. And we're training clinicians in the modular common elements approach, and we call that CBT plus here. So just to show you some of, these some of these manuals, all of these are on Amazon. So if you have interest in anything in particular, and you can read all of them, this says CBITS, that's probably the hardest one to read. All of the treatments are available for purchase. You can buy the manuals, you could learn them. If you wanna learn more about these models, um, these are great websites. The California Evidence-Based Clearinghouse is the middle one. It's a child welfare website, but it's a clearinghouse also for evidence-based practices. You can link to all the articles, the manuals. Uh, the CEBC is an outstanding website. The last one is trauma-specific. That's the National Child Traumatic Stress Network website, worth checking out if you're interested in the treatments for trauma. And then the promisingpracticesnet.net will give you some information across a lot of the interventions. I'm gonna give you lot more, lots more websites too. I'm big on many websites. Before we get into it in more detail, I think this is really important to me in my work, um, and I think is important to lots of folks here at the University of Washington and across the U.S. and internationally, just the fact that although people have had concerns historically about evidence-based treatments and diverse cultural and ethnic groups, the evidence right now is that they're actually a better fit than they are disparate, and that cultural competency and evidence-based practice can actually go hand in hand. And one of these guys, Stan Huey, star, my academic hero. He was here recently and gave a fabulous talk. And so did anybody in here see his talk? Okay, I did. Oh yes, I, I love Stan Huey, he's wonderful. And you can go see his talk online and get his PowerPoints if this is of interest to you. He's probably the leading researcher in evidence-based practice with ethnic minority youth. And so I'd really recommend watching his talk. He's also a great presenter, so you will not be bored. See, now you have something to do over the holidays. <laughs> Watch some talks online. Um, so I do like to just mention this. These are other articles. The slides will be online at our website. These are all fabulous articles if this is a talk that you're, a topic that you're interested in.